12. The 6 o'clock news starts right now. At new at 6, the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center confirming a second member of its donor services staff has tested positive for COVID-19. That worker, one of 10, who was working at the donor pavilion last Friday morning, who was tested after contact tracing when the first worker tested positive late last week. Team members that worked with this latest employee have been asked to get tested as well. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center was working to contact blood donors who had contact with this employee. Officials say that blood donation does usually involve close exposure, but the donors at the pavilion are being contacted even if they weren't around that employee. Advocates for police reform flocking to city council chambers today, continuing their calls for change. City council members had been considering a resolution outlining their priorities for contract negotiations with the police union, but they ended up delaying that to get more input. But as Garrett Berger tells us, they got plenty of input today as well. Before I speak, I want to yield one minute to the lives of Charles Roundtree, Marquise Jones, Antrony Scott, Norman Cooper, and City Council. I am calling on you to raise a fist or take a knee if you stand in solidarity with us today. Though many City Council members have vocally supported the aims of police reform demonstrators, there's still an air of frustration in City Council chambers today. If you truly cared and wanted to make a change, you would start putting together some things that could make a change now. Impact now. I'm committed to advocating for More that. than 20 people who spoke called for steps like defunding the department, repealing state laws that help form the current police union contract, and ensuring bad cops are punished. Telling a racist to not kill black people, knowing that he does not have repercussions for those actions, is not helpful to this community. City Council generally doesn't meet in July while the staff works on preparing the next budget, for which some in the crowd criticize criticize them. But the mayor and council members say that doesn't mean they'll go away. Meetings are happening, conversations are happening, the work is continuing. Yeah. And it appears the movement is ready to continue too. Black Lives Matter! Gary Berger, KSAT 12 Matter. News. The San Antonio police investigating after the statue of Christopher Columbus at a downtown park was vandalized. The statue splashed with red paint. Similar scenes have been happening around the country where statues of Columbus have been vandalized or knocked down. At today's city council meeting, several people were speaking out against historical figures tied to colonialism, slavery, and the Confederacy. District 1 Councilman Roberto Trevino has recently requested the renaming of Columbus Park and the removal of that statue. The COVID-19 pandemic has forced some major adjustments in the way the criminal justice system here operates. But one major component, the grand jury, has continued to operate normally. Paul Venema with why the panel continues working in spite of a moratorium on jury service. The sight of flashing lights and the sound of sirens are troubling reminders of one thing. Crime doesn't stop. And so the cases just keep on coming in. Assistant and District Attorney Eddie Flores is in charge of the DA's grand jury section. Though there's that jury service moratorium resulting in a huge backlog, the grand juries must continue working. There is a deadline in play. There could potentially be very violent people that would get out of jail uh, if the cases aren't presented within 90 days, which is a statutory deadline for felonies. Do you each of you solemnly swear that two new grand juries were sworn in this week to hear the new cases. They'll relieve the current grand juries. Flores says they've done marathon duty, reviewing nearly 3,000 cases. The grand juries have continued to have met as scheduled every single day throughout this whole pandemic. With cases filed daily by law enforcement, Flores is already preparing this group of jurors. They'll begin their service next week with a warning. It is possible if, if you know, things get worse with the virus, they could be extended again, just like this other grand jury. They'd have no options. The work they do is vital, according to Flores. Without them, uh, the criminal justice system will literally come to a halt. Paul Venema, KSAT 12 News. A second degree felony assault charge has been downgraded to disorderly conduct for a man accused in an incident with Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf yesterday. Investigators say the man refused to wear a mask inside of a business. Surveillance video you see here from the Lowe store on I-10 and Callahan appears to show Judge Wolf trying to hand a customer whose name is Terry Toller a business card. That's when Toller slaps it out of his hand. 
Today, Judge Wolf saying he didn't want any criminal charges filed against Toller because he didn't want that to distract from the requirement that businesses have customers wear masks. Yesterday, Wolf admitted his own wrongdoing after he was spotted at a restaurant talking to someone without his mask on. In Texas, Governor Greg Abbott putting the reopening of Texas on pause after two days of recorded increases of positive COVID-19 cases and putting a halt on elective surgeries in the state's most populated counties. Bear, Dallas, Harris and Travis. The number of COVID-19 patients admitted to hospitals has doubled in the last two weeks. Businesses that have opened under the previous phases will be allowed to continue to operate under the protocols from the Texas Department of State Health Services. Governor Greg Abbott in a statement says, quote, I ask all Texans to do their part to slow the spread of COVID-19 by wearing a mask, washing hands regularly, and social distancing from others, end quote. San Antonio police are hoping to get some help from the public, and they're hoping that'll help them catch a killer. 48-year-old Jesus Solis was found dead at his work site in the 5600 block of Tranquil Dawn back in January. That's on the northeast side. Investigators say he was part of a crew that built new roads and was killed during a robbery. Information that leads to an arrest could be worth a cash award of up to $5,000. Call Crime Stoppers at 210-224-STOP. Time saver traffic now. Let's take a look here at I-35 in Loop 410, one of the busiest intersections normally around town, but uh, not so today. Everything is smooth sailing in all directions. New at 6, no thanks to COVID-19. Fewer students will receive scholarships and laptops on Saturday because of a lack in funding. A Burbank High School grad is one of the fortunate few. Due to the pandemic, Jesse Degollada reports the Cesar Chavez Legacy and Educational Foundation couldn't raise as much money as it has in the past. The annual Cesar Chavez March through the West Side, started by the late Jaime Martinez, wasn't the only way his son says his father honored the labor organizer who was his mentor. It was here that Martinez created a foundation to reward deserving high school graduates. This was something he really wanted to continue to do uh, for young people in San Antonio. The Marisol Cortezes of the world who are dreaming a vision of giving back. An interdisciplinary center where um, they both um, treat individuals with special needs um, and those um, suffering from mental health um, issues. On the South Side, where Cortez grew up and where she says it's most needed, the neuroscience major chose Bates College in Maine. I do want to help my community, and I wanted to go to a school that is um, big on helping the community and serving them. Yet due to COVID-19, the foundation raised only $17,000 for scholarships and laptops, far short of the $35,000 it hoped to raise. I believe 30 uh, applications that came in, um, but we were able to honor 10. Who, much like Cortez, can say... I can be in politics, I can be in medicine, I can be in science, I can be a professor, I can do all these things and make an impact and a difference. Thanks, she says, to role models like Jaime Martinez. Jesse Degollado, KSAT 12 News. Look out. outside, <laughs> 93. <laughs> and it does look hazy out there, Adam. Yeah, a little extra haze. I do think we're getting a, a, a little dose of that African dust in the air as we're expecting it. And I think that's going to make some dusty downpours come tomorrow. Now, the aquifer, it could use another splash of water. It's at 660.8, so still above the critical 660 level. But it is down two-tenths of a foot compared to yesterday, and we're two feet below average now. All right, here's the mold. Moderate today at 920, pigweed on the low end. Mixture of sun and clouds out there, no rainfall in the rain gauge at the airport. By the way, we started the day at 72, a little below average, and this afternoon bumped up to 95, two degrees above average. We do have some areas of rain, mostly east of San Antonio, and some heavy rain down near Tilden, far south of town. Floresville, you've got some nice activity in and around your area, stretching over toward Nixon. And a few just popped up around Canyon Lake and near Bull Verde. We're getting the outflow from some of those showers and storms east of town, and that outflow could even pop up and develop more showers here in San Antonio. So cross your fingers. But we're just giving it a 20 to 30% chance for the first part of the evening. Then quiet, increasing clouds, noticeable humidity humidity and a southeasterly breeze at 10 to 15. Tomorrow, more promising rain chances. I think those downpours will be more widespread, a little more numerous 
and they'll be pretty heavy. We'll have more moisture in the air. So by the afternoon hours, our rain chances tomorrow jump up a bit to about 40 50%. That's going to be the highest we'll see them over the next seven days. So those downpours should be good, efficient rain producers. They're not going to hit everybody, but you can cross your fingers and hope for the best. 89. The high temperature tomorrow after a morning low of 75. We'll be back with more on your weather coming right up. Around Texas now, the biggest children's hospital in the state opening its doors to adults as coronavirus hospitalizations continue to go up. Texas Children's Hospital in Houston changing its policy to help create some additional space as other hospitals prepare to activate surge plans that will allow them to expand ICU beds above maximum capacities. COVID-19 hospitalizations in Texas more than doubled in the last month. They nearly tripled in the area at the same time period. At this rate, officials say Texas Medical Center Group hospitals will run out of regular ICU beds in two weeks. Normal ICU capacity at TMC hospitals is 14,062. In emergencies, the hospitals can double that. We're talking about surge planning, that's in Houston, but the same thing is happening in San Antonio. The mayor talked about it last night when we talked to him about the fact that the, play, the hospital system is stressed. Let's listen in. SA Metro Health, Dr. Junda Wu. This is our COVID-19 update for the San Antonio community. The numbers are getting exponentially worse here in Bear County, both in terms of new cases of COVID-19 and more alarmingly, hospitalizations. First, tonight we have 638 new cases of COVID-19 in Bear County to report. That brings our total to 8,452. This is the single largest daily increase since the public health crisis started, uh, but fortunately Unfortunately, we do have no new deaths to report tonight. I'm going to move over to the hospitals because that's uh, the the metric. Those are the metrics that we need to be uh, most concerned about. We have a big jump in COVID-19 hospital patients tonight. Uh, COVID-19 positive patients in local hospitals tonight. 73 more since yesterday, which brings our total to 628. For the first time, we are also over 200 in terms of patients in intensive care with COVID-19, numbers 202, and to be exact, which is um, that that's up 38 from yesterday. 94 patients are on ventilators, that's up 12 from yesterday. Uh, in terms of capacity, again, this is all about flattening the curve and, and our capacity is starting to uh, be significantly lowered. The number of ventilators available is 68% and that has dipped one percentage point and the hospitals remain at 25% of staffed beds available. The hospital system as a whole continues to be under high stress and you can see those figures again at covid19.sanantonio.gov. And I do want to note uh, the governor has made note of this. Uh, the capacity issues are not just here in San Antonio and Bear County, they're out in all urban care areas of Texas. And so the governor ordered the suspension of all elective surgeries in four counties today, including Bear County. Travis, Harris, Dallas, and Bear County also all had their elective surgeries suspended by the governor today. Move over to Judge Wolf. Yeah, th thanks, Ron. And that was a good move by the governor. Uh, we, we do have a, a building problem uh, that's really getting a little scary. Out of the people that are in the hospital, one third of them are in ICU. Are there younger people? And 17.6% of all people that are admitted to the hospital now have COVID. So those numbers are getting very alarming. And if you project it out, say to mid-August, uh, uh, this report came out, I believe, yesterday, uh, we could be in serious trouble. If we do nothing and if we don't work together on this mask issue that we're doing with the businesses, uh, by mid-August, we could have 1,900 people in the hospital. And uh, that would exceed our, our capacity that we have available now. So we've got to really, really work together to um, stop the spread of this. And uh, again, is social distancing, sanitation, and uh, using the mask. Uh, and by the way, on the mask, uh, yesterday uh, uh, to small businesses that came out to the Coliseum, uh, we distributed 240,000 masks yesterday. Uh, that's uh, one-fourth of the... Uh, of the uh, one million that we bought. Uh, we're gonna be on June the 30th out at the North, North Side Independent School District on Calabria in 410, where we will be uh, distributing them. So it's really, really good that the uh, smaller business community is stepping up and people are taking this serious. So again, 
uh, your eyes and ears are important. If you see businesses that are refusing to comply with this, uh, let us know. Uh, and we'll send somebody out there and try to convince them they should. And if they won't do it, then they're going to be fined a thousand dollars for every violation. Thank you, Judge. And, and there's been a lot of conversation about where can I, where am I most likely to catch this virus? And let, let's be clear: you can catch the virus anywhere if you're not protecting yourself with physical distancing and wearing a mask. And in fact, the best place you can be, the, mo the safest place you can be is staying at home. So if you don't need to go out, the infections are increasing at such a rate, it is wise now to stay home. Since the middle of March, I do want to mention, when we did implement stay home and work safe, or the first stay home work safe ordinances, uh, essential workers throughout our region have been working selflessly and tirelessly to support our community, our businesses, and our families. Uh, and we are joining the community tonight to kick off a campaign to honor, celebrate, and show our thanks to all of those essential workers. For the next 19 days, and that's through July 14th, you can show uh, everyone uh, by using your creativity uh, thanks to our essential workers. It can be as simple as making heart hands, and you know how to do that, um, decorating your car, or recording a short video. Snap a picture and share it on Facebook, Twitter, or both, and tag We Heart SA Heroes. There's so many out there, and we need to acknowledge them and give them thanks. Also, when you do that, use the hashtag We Heart SA Heroes. Of course, the best way you can give thanks to the city's essential workers is to help keep them safe, and you can be a hero simply by wearing a mask whenever you go out, uh, and you can also do that and spread that uh, good behavior to other people by taking a picture uh, of you in your mask and posting it using the, ha the hashtag SA Heroes Wear Masks. Um, and you can find more information about the campaign along with a link to in a toolkit to help you show your thanks on the SA, excuse me on the We Heart SA Heroes Facebook and Twitter pages. So join in. There are so many people to thank that are part of this effort to keep us safe. We need to double down and now help them with the good behaviors, physical distancing, wearing masks, and best yet, stay home. Uh, and and let's get that done together. We've got a lot of work to do, folks. Be sure to subscribe to the latest COVID-19 updates by texting COSAGOV to 55000. And you can also learn more anytime about our response to this situation at COVID19.SanAntonio.gov. As I mentioned, Another new record number of new cases of COVID-19 reported today. 638 new cases from just yesterday reported in Bear County. Again, that is a record high for the daily new number. Yeah, that takes us to 8,452 cases since COVID-19 began. Some other numbers, 73 more people have been hospitalized. That means 628 people right now are in our hospitals. 202 of them are in intensive care. That's up 38. The ventilator, the people on ventilators also going up. Uh, the mayor very clear in the fact that our health care capacity is starting to be significantly lowered. A bit of good news in all this, no new deaths to report in the last 24 hours. But clearly these numbers are of grave concern to not only the mayor, not only the county judge, but also healthcare experts in our community. We have talked about this here with uh, one of the infectious disease doctors we talk with every week from UT Health San Antonio. If these trends continue, if we don't see uh, these numbers lessen, we could be at 1900 people hospitalized by mid August. And right now as capacity stands, we don't have that. So that is that surge you were talking about earlier that San Antonio hospitals would have to implement to continue to increase capacity to make room for these patients. Yeah, just from my memory, I I think it, the hospital capacity is somewhere between 12 and 1400 1, staffed beds. We're talking about 1900 beds and that's where places like Freeman Coliseum and other places would be called in to be emergency shelters for a lot of these people that test positive. So again, please wear your mask, wash your hands, keep your social distancing. And like the mayor said, the best place to be right now, the safest place to be is at home. We'll be right back. A lot was going through my mind, you know, I dreamed about this since I was a kid and, you know, to finally make my dreams come true, it, it, felt, it felt crazy. 
San Antonio's newest boxing champion Joshua Franco is back from Las Vegas in big board sports. The champ has returned. Joshua Franco touched down around four this afternoon and he brought some hardware with him, a championship belt. Tuesday night at the MGM Grand Conference Center in Las Vegas, Joshua beat Andrew Maloney by unanimous decision to win the WBA Super Flyweight Championship of the World. KSAT 12 Sports' Andrew Seeley caught up with the champ at baggage claim. When they say in the new, that was that was a, that was a, my last memory from the fight. <laughs> yeah. um, did, did, did there was a sense of relief with the knockdown in the 11th that you felt like you're on the right path of, of taking the victory at that point? Yeah, I I, I thought after uh, I knocked him down, he got back up. That I wasn't gonna be able to finish him, but you know he he was the champ for a reason. He knew how to survive, and that's what he did. But you know either way, I knew I was dominating. You know past past the sixth round. And give me an idea of what it's like holding that thing. It would like, what, how does it feel? What, what's different about it than any other belt you've had before? It just, it feels crazy. You know, it just, it's, it's a world title. You know, it means something. It's history. You know, I, I made history for myself and, and my family, so it feels, it feels good. It, especially with the, on, the, the tradition of San Antonio boxing over the last couple, I mean, especially the last year, calendar year with Mario Barrios too. How does it feel to be a part of that now? It feels great. You know, I'm just, I'm, 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 I'm right there with the legends. I'm right there with, you know, the greats. And, you know, San Antonio has another world champion. We will have much more with the champ Joshua Franco Sunday night on Instant Replay. Turning the baseball, the Flying Chonclas Texas Collegiate League squad held media day at Wolf Stadium this afternoon. The TCL is Texas' first major collegiate summer wooden bat league, and the roster is loaded with local talent. 13 of the 30 players come from San Antonio, Hondo, Spring Branch, Divine, Fredericksburg, Cibolo, and Bernie, and 26 are from the Lone Star State. Texas native John McLaren will lead the way as the team's skipper. We talk about all the time how Corona took all of our seasons away and now we're back here in, in full blast and full motion and sweating a lot here in Texas heat and it's like you want to want you don't take it for granted you know like wouldn't wish for anything else. I've been talking trash with some of my friends from you know sorry from Austin and everything and yeah I think we got a pretty good squad here too so I'm ready to play. In my home city couldn't have been happy playing at Wolf Stadium. Growing up here, like watching Missions game, I was like, it's a dream come true, and I was so excited for the opportunity to play here. San Antonio opened the TCL season in Amarillo with a three-game set from June 30th to July 2nd. The club's home opener is slated for Friday, July 3rd versus Acadiana. One of the greatest dunkers in basketball history, Vince Carter, made it official today. He's retiring after 22 seasons in the NBA. His decision was made easier thanks to a three-point shot in the Hawks' final game on March 11th before play was suspended. Here's what he told Annie Finberg during the Winging It podcast. Making my last shot helped mm -hmm. the, the, the situation because I think, you know, honestly, if I didn't make my last shot, it had been a little different. Yeah. Uh, I'd have felt a little different and I'd have been itching to at least get back and just play one minute and get, just make one shot. I don't care what it would be. Right. Free throw, layup. I don't care. I just, you know, to, you always want to, you know, as a, as a player it, playing their last game, whether you know it or not, you always want to say, well, at least I made my last shot of yeah. my career and I, and I can actually say that. So I'm, I'm happy. All right. Vince says he will now play a lot of golf. <laughs> Good for him, right? Yeah. Vinsanity. Vinsanity. I liked all those highlights except where he dunked on the Spurs. That's so crazy about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Larry. A new message about COVID-19 testing up next. It's the segment of the show we call KSAT Q&A, where we take your questions and our questions to some local experts. As she does almost every Thursday, we are joined by Dr. Ruth Bergeron from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. Doctor, thank you for joining us. First question right off the bat, testing. I know that you have some thoughts on the testing process and where we are right now. Right, so everybody's heard that we're having a big surge of COVID-19 cases here in San Antonio. This has caused people to come out in droves to get tested. And so we have some different messaging for you about testing. Where we were previously telling every asymptomatic person who wanted a test to come in, we've changed our message. The priority should be on people who have COVID symptoms, shortness of breath, dry cough, high fever, loss of your sense of uh, smell or taste or diarrhea. 
If you have those symptoms, yes, we want you to get tested. We don't want you to get tested in the emergency room, however. Our emergency rooms are being flooded. They're being flooded with a lot of sick people. And so if you're not very sick, if you're not terribly short of breath, but you do have symptoms, you need to go to one of the other many sites within our city to get tested. And if you're not sure about that, you can go on the city of San Antonio's COVID-19 website and take a look. You can call 311 um, and one of those ways will get you to a site where you can get tested. The next piece that I wanna be really clear about is if you've had an exposure to somebody with COVID-19, or maybe even a contact tracer called you to let you know about this, please be aware that you should wait at least eight days after that exposure before you go and get tested, because otherwise your test could be a false negative. So how long after uh, you have been around somebody that is confirmed to have COVID, or even I've, I've heard some people say, well, I've been around someone who was around someone who had COVID. So it's almost a secondhand account of somebody uh, who has had it. How long should you wait until symptoms develop or you go get that test? Let's reiterate right. that. There's kind of two parts to your question. So one is what's a significant exposure? Yes. And a significant exposure is one where you have been within six feet of another person who has COVID and you were within six feet for 15 minutes or more without masks. Okay. That is a significant okay. exposure. If you've had that kind of an exposure, then you wanna wait eight days until eight days forward from that exposure. And that's when you're most likely to get a good answer from the test that you go and have. And now, should you be in that eight day period when there's still a question, should you be self isolating in that time yes. just in case? Thank you for bringing that up. If you've had that kind of exposure, like I just described, you absolutely need to be in quarantine. And that means staying home, let other people go and do the grocery shopping and don't go out of your house without a mask and try not to go out of your house. How about the accuracy? I've been getting a lot of questions about the accuracy of these COVID tests, whether you know that is the two or three day test more accurate than the rapid test that can tell you whether you're positive or not in 15 to 30 minutes. Okay, so there's a lot of complexity to this question, Steve, and I want to hone in on some key messages. One is an antibody test is really not helpful to you right now. An antibody test is not helpful. And there are different kinds of tests at different rapidity, and the rapidity doesn't necessarily tell you if it's accurate or not, but the PCR test from a nasopharyngeal swab that most of the time takes two to three days to come back, that's the, the standard one. But even that one, that one can have a false negative rate if you do it too soon. If I was exposed just now, and then I went tomorrow to be tested, I, there would be a 100% chance that my test would be negative, even if I got infected from that. And as you wait day by day, the risk of the false negative goes down, and the chances that you would have a true positive goes up. And your best chance of having a true positive test is going to be eight days after a significant exposure. So that significant exposure being you have been around someone who has tested positive for COVID, you were not taking those precautions, you were within six, six feet or did not have that mask. Wait eight days to get that test. Yes. Dr. Ruth Bergeron, UT Health San Antonio, thank you as always for your time. And we'll see you tonight on the Night Beat at 10. See you later. In the buzz today, we all know no one should stare at the sun, especially for an hour, but no. watching an hour long video of the sun put together by NASA, that's okay. The space agency is even encouraging that. It's a time lapse video where you can safely watch 10 years of the sun. NASA compressed 10 years of images of the sun into a one hour video. The amazing images captured by NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory. NASA says the data collected from the decade long project enabled countless discoveries about the sun's influences on the solar system. What you've seen here is only about a month and a half of activity, but if you want to stare at all 10 years, the full video is online. It does look pretty cool. Yeah.
Gone with the Wind is back on HBO Max, but the film did not return alone. The streaming service has made the 1939 Oscar winner available again, but also added two additional videos to address the inaccurate and racist historical depictions in that movie. One of the videos serve as an introduction to the movie. The video denounces the misrepresentations while examining the film's historical context. HBO Max actually pulled the movie from its platform temporarily two weeks ago amid anti-racism protests following the death of George Floyd. Today is exactly six months until Christmas. Adam yes. Kasky, I hope you are listening to this. That makes this National Leon Day. Okay, <laughs> you should see Kasky's face. Leon is uh, Noel. Actually, we can't. He's got his mask on. <laughs> True. Leon True. is Noel spelled backwards. The point is, crafters begin planning their homemade decorations and gifts so they can have them ready in time for the holidays. Homemade stuff takes time. But if you're a really good holiday shopper, no store will complain if you start now. And people who love the holidays, generally ready and willing to spend time working on or thinking about holiday stuff, like thermometers, so any excuse <laughs> is a good one. So crank down those air conditioners, get that ugly sweater out if you want to celebrate National Leon Day. I think we already qualify with the two Christmas trees Could be. in the studio. Yeah. If you like catfish, today's the day to order it from your favorite restaurant or cook it up yourself because today is also National Catfish Day. The tender, flaky white fish that's even better when it's coated in cornmeal and fried up golden to a crisp. Or maybe slathered in lemon, butter sauce, maybe some fresh herbs. These fish have something called barbels on their face, which look kind of like whiskers, hence the name catfish. What they don't have is scales. President Ronald Reagan designated June 25th as National Catfish Day back in 1987. Huh. Well, at least there's some history to that yeah. one, right? Yeah, you know, it's why, presidential. Why, yeah, there's something yes. to learn there. There you go. Pres presidentially appointed, I should say. That's what it is. Can you hear that difference of when I talk right now? <laughs> yes. Honestly, I, I, I do kind of forget that I'm wearing it a lot around the straight around the station. I you know, wear it inside even here. It was at HEB today, but had to wear the appropriate one because it is Thermometer Thursday. And actually, our weather watcher, Brian Alston, of the total source, he surprised us with a bunch of these and he's getting a nice little downpour right there at his house up in Bull Verde. He just sent me a picture of a good downpour and some heavy rain on the north side of town. We'll talk about that, talk about your forecast and much more coming up. All right, 94 degrees out there. We've really just kind of continued on this track all week. Yeah, we're in a pattern. Maybe. You know, you know who so likes to talk like about those? Yeah, you're right. Yeah. <clears throat> I do say we call them weather patterns for a reason, right? There, there you, you go. go. Because, and by the way, these uh, Therm Thurs masks do make pretty good pocket squares, handkerchiefs, I if love folded the properly. Dramatic discarding of the non Therm Thurs. Get a certain and flare. It's hard to do, but you can kind of fold it properly, and it'll sometimes fit in there. Anyway, they're nice. Another masks. purpose. I've been wearing mine. Because this is just a handkerchief, really. Yeah. That's all it is. So, you know, it's, they both have another function. Forecast and fashion. Nailed it. Yeah. <laughs> all, right. all right. Let's talk about this here. We actually have some decent rainfall across parts of San Antonio. Not a whole lot, uh, but there is a new downpour on the north side of town, so that's something to talk about. And we still have some ongoing showers east of San Antonio. Lavaca County, your activity is coming to an end. Same with Gonzales County. You get into Wilson County, Floresville area, even stretching up toward Nixon. Still some good rainfall. This is good soaking rain, and there's a decent amount of moisture in the air today to give us some good, efficient rain-making storms out there, non-severe storms. But tomorrow, I think even heavier downpours developing and more widespread, more numerous. Bulverde, I mentioned our weather watcher, Brian Olson in Bulverde. He sent me a photo of it just coming down in his backyard. So that's nice. He got hit by that. And thank you for the masks, by the way. That was a good surprise from you. Uh, just west of 281 in the Stone Oak area, we've got a nice downpour. But we're seeing more development here, too. La Cantera area, even crossroads. I-10 and 410, a little shower has developed, but this is where we actually have some lightning and thunder on the far north side of town. Camp Bullis right here on the left side of the screen, Blanco Road, and between Blanco and 281 is where it's really coming down right now, but then you get east of 281, nothing, nada. 
you can see the rain, you can see the thunderhead, you can hear the thunder and see some lightning, but you're not getting any rain right now. Maybe your luck will change as we're seeing a little more development around San Antonio now, but this activity should be really winding down in the coming hours, especially as the sun sets and we lose our daytime heating. It's only about 30% chance through about 9, 10 o'clock. More activity over the Gulf of Mexico, and that's in response to this deep plume of moisture coming in from the southern Gulf that we talked about yesterday, and it's being pushed our way, and it also has a little bit of energy with it as well. Notice the big upper level high, the big blue H, or heat high, not directly overhead. It's actually split now, and it's flanking us, western Mexico and even Florida, so the door's open for the disturbances. I often talk about that. As long as that high isn't directly overhead, the doors open and the opportunities can be there. And we just have, I think, a better opportunity tomorrow. So here's our future cast later on tonight, 11 o'clock. These showers really coming to an end. We'd be lucky to have anything last, I think, past 10 o'clock this evening. Tomorrow morning, a few showers east of town. I think the first half of the day, we just have minimal rain chances. And then we get into the afternoon, we start to boost and elevate those rain and storm chances. And notice by five o'clock, even the computer model indicating some development in or near San Antonio and surrounding counties. It's not a slam dunk for everybody, but at least we've got greater chances with the situation that's coming together tomorrow. So that's nice to see, especially because beyond then we're looking at minimal rain chances. So tomorrow more numerous and more widespread downpours, so better coverage across South Texas. And then we get into the weekend 20% chance, and that may even be generous. That'll last through Monday. All right, look at this one triple digit reading. That's Del Rio, but then we have 80 and Gonzalez. Look at that big temperature difference. 20 degrees from Del Rio to Gonzalez. 94 here in San Antonio, Pleasanton at 88. We'll wake up to temperatures in the 70s again and probably top out near 90 degrees. I think that added chance of rain, a little extra cloud cover will limit our heating a little bit compared to the past few days and a bit breezy too. southeasterly wind at 10 to 20 tomorrow. Tropical downpours. That's what we're expecting with a little bit of sunshine mixed in a lot more moisture in the air. They should be good, efficient rainmakers tomorrow. Temperatures in the lower 90s this weekend. The next week as we turn off our rain chances. Well, that's when we actually see our temperatures start to rise and start to climb and we'll be in the upper 90s. It looks like by the middle of next week, maybe even Flirt with triple digits there for a little bit. Okay, <clears throat> this is not thermometer related on this Thermometer Thursday, but it's a good question I recently fielded from a viewer. Why are we called meteorologists? Hmm, it's a good question. We don't study meteors. No. Meteors are in outer space. We study what's in our atmosphere. Okay, so this all goes back to a book, which I do have a copy of. Okay, goes back to 340 BC when Aristotle wrote the first book on meteorology. It was the first documented and known discussion theorizing meteorology. That's 340 BC. He titled it Meteorologica. See the connection now? Back then, they had very, well, uh, like, I guess a loose definition of what a real meteor is, right? And basically anything moving through the sky or up above us was loosely termed as, you know, a meteor. So the study of it, meteorology, whether it be a hailstone, a real meteor, a raindrop, a cloud droplet. So this is the first book, and it was actually the authority on weather theory through the 1600s. Even in Western civilization, that is until we got more precise instrumentation and we learned more. But that is why we are called meteorologists, because of the book Meteorologica by Aristotle. It's actually a pretty fun read. Well, it's not an easy read, but it's an interesting read. I haven't finished it. It's hard to finish. All right, let's get to the winner. Cecil H. Gonzalez, Jr. of Floresville. You're the winner of this week's homemade thermometer. And maybe in the future we can talk about how not just anybody who does weather is a meteorologist. But that, that's we don't have enough time for that right now. Oh, you want to get started? You just no. planted a seed. I know I did, in <laughs> case you missed it coming up next.
on the same day that the San Antonio City Council listened to calls for action on the relocation of a Christopher Columbus statue from Columbus Park. That statue was vandalized, covered in red paint. Last week, we told you about District 1 Councilman Roberto Trevino and Antonio Diaz with the Texas Indigenous Council pushing for that statue to be moved because of its representation of colonialism, slavery, and the Confederacy. The Councilman Trevino's request for consideration would put the item on the Governance Committee's agenda. It's unclear when a final decision will be made. Police are investigating the vandalism. San Antonio firefighters responded to a fire call at an HEB on the northwest side. It happened just after one in the 9900 block of Warsbach, just off of I-10. When crews got there, they found light smoke around the pharmacy. After getting onto the roof, they determined the cause to be electrical and quickly took care of the problem. HEB workers were then allowed back inside. No one was hurt. The number of laid off workers who applied for unemployment benefits fell to 1.48 million last week. That's according to the latest numbers. The steady decline in claims suggests that the job market has begun to heal from the coronavirus pandemic, which shuttered businesses and sent the unemployment rate up to 14.7% in April. That's its highest level since the Great Depression. The iconic Eiffel Tower is ending its longest closure since World War II. Today, it finally reopened to the public with social distancing measures in place. Only limited numbers of people will be allowed in and elevators to the top will be out of service, at least at first. That means visitors will have to take the stairs. That's all our time. Thanks for watching the news at six. See you back here on the night beat at 10.